JJ, the CPA here, hope you're doing well. So when you wake up and you're getting ready and you're heading in for the day, what is it that you're looking forward to? And what is it that you're not dreading? Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not talking about saying that work has to be fun. It's called work for a reason. I'm talking about the things you like to do because there's things I like to do, there's things you like to do, and it's hard work. Or it is things that when you tell somebody else, they're like, oh man, I wouldn't like to do that. I do taxes, most wouldn't want to do that. I'm talking about for you and your inner core. And what's interesting is your mind, your body, right? It's all yours, but it's going to tell you these things as you're going in typically. Maybe not every day, based on distractions or kids along for the ride going somewhere that you're dropping them off. But I'm talking about when your brain, your automatic pit in your stomach or the excitement in your hands or in your heart, do more of what is exciting you. Do less of what is there that you're not looking forward to. How? Remember, you're in control of things. If you're a small business owner, you have 100% control or at least the percentage to your ownership. If you're working with somebody else, you have a lot, believe it or not, of control. Now, some of it may be that you're switching where or who you're working for. And I'm not talking about all or nothing. This isn't an encouragement to now run and jump off the cliff and quit your job or close down your business because you're now going to only do what it is that excites you. But why couldn't you put yourself in that position with careful and thoughtful planning, right? Meaning anybody that's going to make a job shift, uh, anybody that's going to make a major change in their business, right? There is a jumping off of the cliff but doing it smartly, right? So that when you jump off, you know how far it is to the bottom, you have a parachute, etc. So changing things isn't overnight, but changing things is in your control. For those that are working for others, um, if you don't really feel like switching to somebody else or another employer, another job, another company is gonna solve it, what side hustles could you be doing? I'm never in favor of, well, I've came with my side hustle. I know that I can make a lot of money. So I'm running and I'm jumping off the cliff. What makes sense is that you would start that side hustle, get it rolling, get it going, identifying your customers. What I'm not for, to be honest with you, is you team things up to then take customers from your employer or the business that you're working for. Personally, when I started my business, my grandfather advised it, I followed it, but I didn't take one client from my former employer, the CPA firm I worked for before I went out on my own. You know what? If customers are wanting to follow you, okay, they're going to follow you. The few that were, and I think it was three, because I was young, that said, hey, I'd like to work with you. I was like, well, you just want to stay where you're at. All I'm saying is this, you can do it in an ethical way, high moral, be ready to sacrifice, be ready to make changes, but pulling money out of retirement is not a way to sacrifice. But lining up a loan or saving up for how you're gonna make a transition. The other thing is, I'll just tell you that when you're talking to others about what puts a pit in your stomach as you're driving in, riding the bus in, walking in, if you will, to work or what excites you, right? That just like, oh, most people are in your brain. <laughs> most people aren't in your body. Most people don't have your experience. They don't have your background. They don't know the things that you think about, you dream about, I mean, literally. And it doesn't matter if it's your spouse or your sibling or your parents. Yes, probably makes sense to have discussions with them, bounce ideas off of them and get their opinions. Um, those people are either advisors or mentors or people that you trust, but know this. 
You're the one that's in control. Only you really can decide what it is that you ultimately want to do regarding what I'm talking about here. Meaning, your parents, your spouse, your partner, your longtime girlfriend or longtime boyfriend or your fiance or your older siblings or younger siblings or you name it, right? They're not with you when you're by yourself. They're not with you when you're working, when you're talking to customers or vendors. They're not really going to be able to make the decision for you. And the reason I say that is that many then continue to settle. They continue to, in essence, put up with the pit in their stomach. And, you know, any situation is going to have probably something you're not looking forward to, right? But my point is, is that we then just continue to settle because we weren't able to convince somebody else. Now, you might have that one person that's just like, go for it, jump off the jump off the cliff. It doesn't mean it has to be tomorrow, right? You can still do it with careful planning. Maybe it takes six months. Maybe it takes a year. Be patient about it, right? No one typically, unless we're talking about an abusive situation, no one has to, oh, I got to just make a change today. What you got to do is just go, okay, well, I got to make a change. So I'm going to start planning for it today, right? Doing it seriously. And in some ways, That'll prove out to you if you really do need, want to make a change. Um, many have realistic uh, responsibilities that affect their ability or decision-making process to make a change, which is what, right? Money. Well, I got these responsibilities. I don't know that I can make that much money or I have these responsibilities. I, I, I don't believe if I made this switch, I will make as much money depending on what you're planning to do. <clears throat> so maybe in your planning process though, what is it that you can shift in terms of what monies are required? And that is part of your planning process, right? Because I have told uh, many young folk when I talk with college students, uh, with, a, with a couple of groups in the accounting world <clears throat> where you're just sharing your experience and giving a realistic view to younger folks on what it's like to be a CPA and in the accounting world. And that way it's kind of helping them make decisions. Uh, and then as I've had younger staff, you know, I've had my own CPA practice for 28 years, but as I've had younger staff and including my own kids, my daughter's 25 and or almost, and my son is 19, but I've said, you know, <clears throat> money won't, buy you happiness. And of course, wow, what a cliche. But I go on to explain that the reason money won't buy you happiness is that, uh, I don't know why people can't figure stuff out I'm just sitting here in a parking lot. Um, the reason money won't buy you happiness is that it doesn't matter what you're making, if you're not happy doing it, meaning you're just dreading it the entire time, uh, then you're going to have a lifestyle that may be supported by that money, but that may make you happy, but it typically isn't enough to make you happy for the amount of time that you're having to dedicate to what's not making you happy. What do I mean by that? Well, the time that you wake up and think about what you have to do in your day related to what is generating the money to support your lifestyle while you're taking a shower and brushing your teeth and getting ready. Uh, whatever time and effort you're devoting to that, maybe none. Uh, the time that you're traveling, you know, whether you're walking a block or riding a bus or a train, uh, driving a car, commuting, whatever the amount of time, uh, maybe you blast it. Uh, music and read the paper and you don't spend any time on that, but you're still spending time now towards getting to your job, regardless if you're thinking about it. Then you got to arrive and typically most are putting in a specific number of hours, typically eight, but when you throw in a lunch break and then the travel back, right? Eight hours of work, maybe a 30 minute lunch, maybe 30 minutes in, maybe 30 minutes home. Right, so now we're at nine and a half hours. You already know how many hours are in a day. But the time and effort related just to that physically, but then the mind effort, if you will, that's beyond that, 
you know, even if you just added another half hour a day, 15 minutes before and 15 minutes after, you know, this starts to add up. And, and all that's to say is whatever money you're making isn't going to be enough to make that worth it probably after two weeks or probably after a month when you're just literally dreading the, you know, almost half of your day or you're not satisfied with nearly half of your day. And that affects then your productivity, affects your ability to really do what you're doing to its fullest, um, to do it honorably, not to be insulting, but to do it honorably, meaning you're putting in your best either to your customers or your vendors, to your employer, um, to those that are you know relying on your business. What's the point of that? And I'm sure some would be like, no, 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 no. There's a dollar, man, I'd probably do anything. Okay, then do that for nothing and make sure that it would be anything that you would do. Oh man, if you paid me a million dollars, that's just not realistic talk. But you can do pre-planning. So what I tell young folk is, doesn't matter what you get paid, if you don't like what you're doing, it'll never be worth it. Whether it's 52 grand or 86 grand or 140,000 or 250,000 or 300,000 or even whatever your business is going to net and help you bring home, if you will. So maybe you're making changes to the lifestyle. Maybe you own a smaller house. Maybe you um, downsize, uh, whatever the case is. Whatever you need to do, right? But the problem is, is that many times uh, young folk, uh, you know, they take a job, of course, they're, you know, how much are you going to pay me? How much are you going to pay me? And they're going to go typically with the highest payer. Great. That makes sense. Uh, but then they start building a lifestyle based on that income or a small business owner, you know, based either on their success or their projected success, they start building a lifestyle around that which then locks them in to what they had decided uh, they thought they were gonna do. So be mindful of, are you locking yourself in to uh, more dissatisfaction than satisfaction with your day, with your work, with your job, with your business, just simply because you feel like you locked yourself in? Um, You know, when I was in college and I was a sophomore, and I skipped my senior year of high school, um, in essence. Um, and long story short, I started college when I was 17. So when I was a sophomore, I was 18. And I knew at that time I wanted to have a CPA practice. I understand that's unusual. I understand some could say, well, you had a grandfather that had a CPA practice, so of course you were thinking that. Eh, wrong. I didn't know what a CPA practice was or what a CPA was. My grandfather was a CPA. And all I know is that I I wanted a lifestyle like his. That was it. But I knew I wanted to be a CPA and I knew I wanted to have my own business. And then, yes, after an hour conversation with my grandfather, I was like, yeah, okay, well, the business I want to own, being a CPA, is a tax practice. And so finishing out the school, sophomore, junior, senior year, getting a five-year degree in four years. And then you have to work for a CPA firm to become a CPA or you have to work underneath a CPA Uh, for 4,160 hours. Maybe there's a state that is different, but in the state I was in, that was what was required, meaning I had to work two years for somebody else. And then I knew that probably after two years, I didn't know quite enough. Um, And so long story short, basically about four and a half years after I graduated, um, so right at age 25, I was able to open up my own CPA practice, but that was a seven-year plan. That was a what does it require? How much could I make? What would my lifestyle be? Um, what what should I be committing to? It a you know when should I start having kiddos related to this? And it also helped me put together a plan of well, what checklist do I need, and what advertising would I do, or how would I promote myself, and what services would I provide, and what would be my hourly rate? So you know we don't have to have instant gratification to make changes to whether it's your lifestyle or your business or, you know, you name it, we can take our time and that's in essence somewhat up to you. But, you know, those that typically just go, you know what, I can't do this anymore and they run and jump 
off the cliff typically then find themselves either back where they were or doing detrimental things like, well, now I got to pull money from retirement um, or I'm borrowing way more than I should if I did some pre-planning and or, well, I didn't really think this through and so it's really not going to work out. So I got to go back to whatever it was that I wasn't enjoying, if you will. <clears throat> so planning ahead for it and Back to what I said originally, what is it that you're doing that you enjoy, right? We may overstate that maybe here more in America. When we think of enjoy, we, you know, think of, you know, fun and games maybe. Enjoy is, for me at least, you know, satisfaction, enjoying, looking forward to it, um, you know, bringing me happiness in the sense of, wow, I'm really glad that client's happy. Uh, I loved being able to save that client some money. I enjoyed helping that client uh, have more money for their bottom line for whatever else is that they were needing, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it is hard work, you know, in my business, similar to yours probably, or who you work for, there's times that you're like, man, what am I doing this for, <laughs> right? When you're at in the depths of it and the amount of time I have to put in, especially during tax season and all-nighters and things like that. But I'm getting something out of that. <clears throat> and then the things that we don't like doing <clears throat> or doing with, we need to try and remove and you can have timing with that. So, you know, right now, um, I'm going back through my check, I'm going back through my client list pretty much like I do every year. And I'm coming up with a, a list of uh, really good clients that, you know what, I'm gonna need to, I'm gonna need to let them go here in November. Um, and if you read the book, Good to Great, as in making your life, your business, good to great, making it great, you have to get rid of some good to make room for the great. And for most Americans, that doesn't compute with them. And guess why? Because they're locked in or they're locked into more is better, not necessarily. So I back up just to say, when I look at good clients, good clients as in, well, they pay on time, they're good people, they're not committing fraud, they're not necessarily all that difficult, um, but I'm doing other things now that are actually bringing me more joy, more enjoyment. This right here, uh, seminars, uh, continuing professional education, uh, presenting that brings me a lot of joy. Now, I'll always be a CPA with a CPA practice. Uh, I've got a list of clients that, um, you know, as long as they need me, I'm going to be their CPA. But I've got to remove some of that because that aspect is part of what the pit in my stomach is. That aspect is what is causing me to not look forward to some part of my day. And it's Basically, even though these are good people, even though they're what you would say is a good client, but there's, you know, one or two aspects, though, that bring that sense of, <sighs> right? And I'm in a position that I can carve that out. Now, you know, it might be just 10, 12, you know, clients, but each year I carve out clients that bring the, ah, <sighs> for whatever the reason is. And... Part of that is just to ensure I have the enjoyment. It's making room, especially when I was taking on new clients, making room for different clients that are in essence, for lack of a better word, better for me. They're great clients for me in terms of what I'm wanting to do. So do more of what you are excited about in your day. Do less of what you're not. Plan ahead for it. Could be seven years. But how long are you going to live? I bet every single one of us wouldn't say, eh, another six months, probably a year, right? So I better jump off the cliff right now. <laughs> Most of us, you know, I get it depending on your age, you know, but I'm just about to hit the line of being 50. And if you were to ask me, I was like, eh, you know, I probably got another 30, 40 years, right, in me. Might be gone in five, might be gone in 12, might be gone tomorrow, but when I think of it like, well, how much longer do I got to go? 
then it, inc it, it, it encourages, encourages me or gives me courage in two different ways. One, okay, then I can do this to the best of my ability with this change. So like with these clients, it's something I've been thinking about since the beginning of the year. Um, and that's just a very small decision. So you have time to tee it up. Doesn't mean you need to take seven years, but you have time to tee it up so that you're ensuring that you have the right parachute and you know the distance of this cliff that you're jumping off to, in essence, bring in the example of preparedness. And then also where maybe the bigger amount of courage comes from this is that you are realizing, you know what, I don't wanna do this for the next 20 or 30 years. So yeah, I do wanna make a change. I do have time to make a change. And you know what? For many, it may be, well, once the kids are out of the house, then I'm going to make this change. Then I'm going to downsize. Then I'm going to change my lifestyle, right? So in five years, 10 years, two years, or what you name it, right? Name it. It, it could be that, well, once I'm done with these responsibilities or once I'm done providing the lifestyle that my, now, that my family's now used to, as in my kiddos, well, then after that, when it's really affecting less, so to speak, well, then that's when I'll make these changes and then planning ahead for that. And guess what? That'll probably bring less pit in your stomach, so to speak, on the way in because you're looking forward to what's to come. It'll uh, make you more excited about ensuring that as you're doing your planning that you're including more of what it is that you enjoy doing in the future. So as I'm going in today, this day specifically, um, I've got a couple of uh, client uh, calls and one meeting. Clients I've been working with for over 20 years, if not 23, can't wait to meet with them. Like, can't wait. And we're gonna be talking about taxes, okay? We're not gonna be getting caught up only on life. We're gonna be talking about taxes and I can't wait to talk with them, check in with them, give them news, tell them where we're at, tell them what we can do, the things I've been doing for 28 years. But then guess what? The rest of my day, this day in particular, I am going to be only working on doing some videos, doing some things related to YouTube, doing some things related to seminars, et cetera. And I couldn't be more excited related to that. If you were to say, hey, uh, today you could go play golf because I love to play golf. Or you could do that and be like, you know what? Um, I want to do this today. But you know what I did? I had to pre-plan uh, starting a week ago to kind of carve out this day to do that. So very short decision for a very short period of time, but it required planning ahead. Well, hey, thanks for tuning in to here. I appreciate you. Uh, this is just things that I talk to my clients about. These are conversations that I talk to my clients about. And I had a discussion yesterday with a client similar to this, talking about these same things. And both their kids have graduated recently uh, or, or their their youngest had graduated high school, just similar to mine and kind of what's the next step. And, you know, do they want to continue to do these things and lifestyle and making you happy? And this is a particular client that no joke, no joke brings home after tax 1.2 million, brings home after tax, after paying all bills and expenses, 1.2 million. They live in a house that's uh, only cost them 300,000 and they paid it off probably 15 years ago. Uh, drives a vehicle that's three years old, has zero debt. School's already saved up and kids' schools are, the money's already sitting there to pay for it and making decisions even in those circumstances. All right. Hey, thanks for tuning in. I'd love it if you'd subscribe. And then don't you ever forget, you've never met a CPA quite like me. Have a great one.